I think I'm having an art attack. What's up, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Art Attack with your host, Lizzie Dastin, art history professor extraordinaire, super brainiac, knows more about art history than any of you guys even can imagine, certainly a lot more than I do. Uh, however, I'm an artist and she can't paint. Boom! <laughs> Better take that mic check down on that one. But anyway, <laughs> um, so we love doing this show. And now that we're doing YouTubes of the show, visuals of the show, it really adds another dimension. So everybody on iTunes who's been listening to this audio podcast, just audio only, check us out because there's a visual dimension that we've added to the show. Today, we are talking about New York City spotlit artists. Of course, these were all chosen by Lizzie. Some of them I love, these paintings that you've chosen, these, these pieces of art that you've chosen, and some of them make me sick. Uh, <laughs> so feel free to choose others. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I, but, but I like the fact that you chose them because you do the heavy lifting for the show. I am just the face. I'm the beauty. You're the brawn. So, um, oh my God. If I had a dollar for every time someone I called me had the brawn, a dollar for every time somebody <laughs> called me the brawn, I'd give my whole dollar to Jew. And I take it because I'm Jewish. Okay, go ahead. All right. So, the theme of this show actually came from the suggestion of a listener. So, we should do a shout out to her. It's to Abigail, a very Devoted friend of the podcast and one of the closest friends in my life. Abigail in the... <laughs> Abigail oh, who lives in New York. And she, I think, really we love liked Abigail. the... We do love Abigail. But yeah. she really liked what we did with the episode on LA, which was a feature on particular things that come out of this city, are illustrative of the city. And so she suggested that we do that in other places, which I think is really smart. And New York is the best place to start because... It is always regarded as the epicenter of the art world. And so with that kind of reputation, where do you go? If you live in New York, if you're visiting New York, how do you engage with art? And how can you find or understand better art that is maybe a little off the beaten path? Now, growing up in New York City, in the epicenter of art, I was lucky enough to play tag in <laughs> the, the Natural History Museum. Uh, on Amsterdam Avenue, I'm sorry, at Upper West Side of New York City, and the Metropolitan Museum, and the MoMA, and we have the Frick, and we have the Guggenheim. We have a lot of museums there. I would say probably the greatest collective collection anywhere in the world, with the exception of maybe Paris, because they have the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay, et cetera, and so on, but we have so much art there. It is so completely full of art. And of course, as I was growing up in New York in the 70s, I also had the art of Lee and, you know, uh, Tracy 168 and all the graffiti art and Dondi and Zephyr and whatever, whatever, Futura, all over the walls. So art is everywhere in New York. It's on the streets. It's in the galleries. It's in the museums. We've got great galleries there as well. Uh, and for the most part, it's free. We have the big, the biggest museum is the Metropolitan. Of course, you can make a donation. And when I was a kid, I would always give like, you know, five cents. Now I give a lot more, like, you know, $10 every time I go because I feel like a guilt kind of, I, I want to support the arts and the museum. So I give a minimum of $10. But every time when I was a kid and I couldn't afford anything because I was broke, I would give like a nickel or a dime or a quarter, you know, whatever I could afford. And we would just hang out there all day and stare at Rembrandts and Rubens. And it was crazy that we have access to so much incredible art. So why don't you talk about, why don't you illuminate some of these illuminating pieces for our viewers' imagination? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm glad that you mentioned the behemoth institutions in New York. So the Met and MoMA and the Frick and the Neue Gallery and the Guggenheim and the Whitney. I mean, there is just so much to look at. Yeah. But what I want to start off by doing is to explore the outskirts of that total mainstream. And personally, my favorite art in New York is actually in Soho, and it's called The Earth Room, and it's sponsored by Dia. 
And DIA. Who, okay, yeah. I was going to ask, what's DIA? The DIA Art Foundation. So they're very supportive of artists. And I believe this was in the 70s, maybe 1977. That's when Earth Art starts to rise in prominence. And Earth artists like Robert Smithson, he's the guy who did Spiral Jetty. Goldsworthy. Yeah. Yeah, that was a nice. I know some Earth art. Yeah, he but he was a like, random you're Earth artist. At me like, what? Did no, that you was just... an esoteric reference. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I, I know some about Earth art. I, I would think that you probably don't love Earth art. And so. Um, I feel mixed feelings about Earth art. I feel that the Earth is art. And I feel like, why mess with something that's so perfect? Like, sometimes if you see lava or a volcano or you know, a formation of flowers, you have this kind of fractal, incredible beauty that artists can't even figure out or interpret. Most artists, right? Because they're not keyed into the, the the Fibonacci sequences of the world. But like the earth that the the art that the earth produces is so beautiful and profound. It's a weird thing. So there's a part of me that says, yeah, that's really cool that we're taking that and we're putting it on an easel or we're putting it on a pedestal. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. the other way is like why why are we doing that it's already there and how can you get greater than earth's art yeah i see that i think it's the intention of these artists was to just funnel creative interest and awareness onto the earth and at this point up until the early 1970s the art world was very myopic and limited to these precious pristine walls of museums and galleries and so I think there was this wonderful opportunity for artists to see beyond those white spaces. And so people like Smithson and like Demaria and like Agnes Denny's, they went outside the space of the gallery and found fodder for their inspiration in nature. And Demaria, he took nature and brought it back into the gallery. Mm -hmm. So there, it was a dual agenda, either go outside and then we can still see some of these works if you take a pilgrimage. I've never seen Spiral Jetty. I've never seen Demaria's Lightning Field. It is hard to see them. And What's so, that fence? That fence that Christo's went fence? Yeah, Christo's fence. I mean, that, is that Earth art or is that He's just kind of is that just shit outside in the in the atmosphere? <laughs> like, what is that? No, seriously, what is that? Is that Earth art? I think that Christo is aligned with Earth, earth art, but also more installation and performance okay. because his work is temporary. So when he wraps buildings, when he does that huge fence, he did the gates in New York mm -hmm. a few years ago, mm -hmm. those orange gates. There's a temporality to them that is not true for the earth art of Michael Heiser. And an example in L.A. is Levitated Mass. So that's Heiser. He's an earth artist. And so that's a quintessential example, taking from a quarry a gigantic boulder and then repositioning it within an art space. But that's the example of going outside to nature to find your space for performance, space for creativity. So what Demaria does in Soho is that he sources dirt and then puts tons and tons, thousands of tons into this Dia gallery space. And so when you walk up the stairs, and very few people know about this, you are overwhelmed Where, where by is this gallery in New York? So Soho. People, okay, but, okay, Soho. What's Where the, the gallery again is? It's called the Earth Room, Earth and it's Room, Dia. Dia in Soho, just for anybody who wants to go there, who please, happens to be in New York. Yes, please go. It's incredible. Do you have to pay? No, I don't think so. Or if you do, it's nominal, and it's worth and it. And if you do have to pay, just say, uh, Lizzie Dasson and Justin Boo from <laughs> Art Attack said you don't have to, and when they grab you, say, fuck you, and keep walking into the museum. If you get arrested, that's on your own. Yeah, but whatever, totally. It'll be a fun, fun story. Yep. So you walk up, and you are immediately overwhelmed by this noxious odor of dirt, and there's just something kind of suffocating and also primal and frightening, but nourishing to me about the smell of soil mm. because it's wet, it feels oppressive. And so I think that shapes the experience because mm -hmm. it's like you're cocooned within the logic, the realm of the environment. Now, when you go to a gallery, you expect to see art on the walls and you expect to be able to move around. But all of those expectations are thwarted in the earth room. You go and there's a partition but the entire gallery is filled with thousands of tons of dirt. I think it's 3,600 square feet, so it's massive. And you can't leap over the partition and play, which is, of course, what I always want to do. You have to just watch. And so it's contemplative. It 
really redefines the experience of looking because now it's holistic. You're smelling, you're feeling, you're included in the process. And the dirt is so high that I think there is an analogy to death a little bit, but also maybe Mm. the regenerating nature of life. And so it feels poetic. Well, I haven't seen it, but I will take your word for it. I feel like I... I could smell it and feel it from your description, and I, and I like, I like that. I, you know, I'm into anything that's going to be new and that's that's sensory related and that could take me to a different place of sparking my imagination and for inspiration. Uh, the next piece that I would like to talk about is probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous, uh, top five. Got to be top five. Starry, starry night. Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, and that is at the MoMA. And as a kid growing up in New York City uh, and having access to Starry Night, I was always perplexed at how small it was because we've seen Starry Night in movies. We've seen Starry Night in animation projects. I mean, Starry Night has been plagiarized, painted. It's on probably more merchandise than anything besides potentially the uh, Adam and God, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel uh, in the Vatican. I think that was probably the most, I think it's the most prolific merchandise licensed image ever. And it's certainly most relatable image is Van Gogh's Starry Night. And you look at it and it's small. I mean, it's breathtaking. It's beautiful. You have the animated you know, stars and the swirl of the atmosphere and the wind and the cypress trees and the buildings. It's alive. It's alive. You have this thing. And that's why people animate it so much. It's because you have a painting that is actually living in brushstrokes. We never really saw anything to that level before. And he really took it to that level. And as stylized as it is, as small as it is, it's probably one of the most most breathtaking images of all time. Usually when things are so seen, you know what I mean, exhausted in the media in every form, you get tired of it. You never really get tired of seeing Starry Night because there's something alive about it. And that story of Starry Night makes us feel like we need to be alive. So that awakens our desire for living, our desire for loving, our desire for smelling art, our desire for being involved in life. That's what Van Gogh does, really. And I don't really think that anything is as emblematic as Starry Night is. And that aliveness is even further emphasized when you see the work in person at MoMA because when you look at the brushwork, you can see that Van Gogh, he doesn't paint to the end of the canvas, that there are large, relatively large pieces of exposed canvas that he just doesn't paint. And so what does that do? It gives us the sense of an artist who is frantic, who has something in his mind that he just has to imprint. He has to get out. And so he's not painting in a precious, precise way. He doesn't care if he gets all the corners. He just needs this image to go from his mind to something else, something more permanent. And so I do think that chaos, that frantic energy that you talk about that makes the painting so alive, that that is even seen in the the mechanics of his brushwork. But you only know that if you see it in person. Yeah, I mean, you have to pay when you go to the MoMA, just so you know, just giving you full warning. Uh, it is a very precious museum. It is a very beautifully architecturally designed museum. Uh, but you will not miss Starry Night. You will not miss it. I mean, it is it is a main attraction for viewers all over the world. And people come from all over the world to see it because it is one of the few. What do you think that that is one of those pieces like you see in those diamond commercials? Like it's priceless. You could not put I don't think you could sell. There's some works in the world that are like, you know, like a Rembrandt sold for one hundred eighty million dollars or a Jeff Kuhn sold for this or a Picasso sold for that. I, I think that this is one of those paintings that I think is priceless. I don't think that you could finance this painting, which is a very weird thought with all of America and Europe and Russia's money together. 
Well, you couldn't, and it would never be up for auction because it is so symbolic of pride, of, of local pride for MoMA, but also for New York City. So I don't think it's ever going anywhere, but Van Gogh rarely makes it to auction, his landscapes like that. And that's so, because it's in collections though, right? Yeah, I think that it's because of the paucity of physical works, even though he did two, basically he did two canvases or two versions of every image, but he had a short life. And so there just aren't, there isn't a big volume of his his paintings. Well, and the so, same the same with Rembrandt. I mean, Rembrandts yeah. are not being sold because they are property of museums and there's just not a lot on the market and they're not used for commerce like a lot of other, you know, Jeff Koons are all over the place and Picasso's are all over the place and you know, Damien Hirst are all over the place, but like these paintings have landed and they're not going anywhere and and that's because the museum understands the value of them and they will never let them go to auction. Right. And I'm glad that you're referencing this painting because it is probably the most famous, significant work in New York City. And so in that respect, it doesn't need a spotlight, but it does with the way that you're engaging with it. And people go to MoMA, they see the work just so they can check off some imaginary box, maybe take a selfie with it, or just say that they saw. But I think you really need to slow your experience of looking and you need to trace the brushwork And you have to put yourself in the mind of the man who created it and try to encapsulate and embody that psychological state. And so I think that's really important. And it's great to re-examine something iconic through a new lens. Starry, starry night, paint your palette blue or gray. The next piece that we are going to talk about is the Alice in Wonderland sculpture. Not yet. So no? while we're in MoMA, oh. let's talk about uh, another uh, work that's in MoMA because we've just spent $20. So let's linger okay. a little bit. Okay, let's stay. Yeah. So a piece that I love in MoMA is not iconic at all. Maybe the artist is, but this is not illustrative of his oeuvre. And that would be the painting of Lipschitz by Diego Rivera. And I believe it's 1919 but definitely within, it's painted within a Cubist style. And if you know Rivera's work, it's that he is a social realist painter. He is painting mostly in Mexico City at the time of the Mexican Revolution. And the images were mural format and totally peopled with recognizable political figures. He wanted his art to storytell and to have a really particular narrative, which was propagandistic, all in support of communism. And that kind of social realist painting is at odds visually from the avant-garde mode of Cubism. And so it's not as well known that Rivera starts out as a Cubist painter. And so I- He started out as a Cubist painter? Yeah, see, it's not that well known. (laughs) No, seriously, I I, I had no idea. I really didn't. So he's basically copying- Picasso and Brock or looking up to them or, you know, yeah, I, mean, I would say copying. In that movement. Right. I would say that he is Influenced. using, yeah, certainly influence. He's using their energies to approach his own subject matter. And he is painting a sculptor. Lipschitz was a fellow artist. But the most wonderful moment to me about this painting is that there are little swatches of color. And typically in Cubist work, the color palette is grisaille, which is a reference to grayscale. Grisaille is a French word. And that choice was made so that the viewer's attention was on the way that the shape and the form is unfolding through time. That we don't want to be caught up with color because that distracts our our energies from what's really going on, which is fracturing the picture plane and then reimagining it through this concept of duration. So Rivera, he adds a little splash or a few moments of color, and one looks like he's referencing a serape in the color patterning and the colors and the patterning. And so I love that because it is a glimmer into his Mexican heritage that soon would characterize his career and how we know about him. You know, I I have a different perspective on this painting. I think it's fine. It's not great. I think Diego Rivera is a great painter. I think he's a greater muralist, and his work belongs not on the canvas, but on the walls. Much like you feel about street artists. Like when sometimes when you see street art, you're like, that doesn't belong in a gallery. That belongs in public space. And I really feel strongly about that. And I I, I see I see the fact that 
you're starting out, you're creating on Canvas, and it's cool to look at that. Much like when I look at my really old work, I'm like, oh, that's cool, but I can't tell you that my work is great. It's not. It's fine, it's good, but later on, you could see that my work gets better and better. And I think that I see that with this Diego Rivera. And I think it's just cool the fact that it's that he did it and that you get a look, a glimpse into his early work. Absolutely. That he did it and then he departed from it. Yep. That's yeah. Cool. And there's so much value in seeing the beginnings of an artist's career and then celebrating what makes him or her iconic and then seeing what happens next. I love looking at the entire trajectory of an artist's working method because so often one artist is reduced to one image. And I think that happens to Rivera. I, I agree with you. Which one? Which one? Like the flowers? The the lady with the flowers? I would or say the Rockefeller mural. If Rivera's the known one that for was anything, covered up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a whole But I think that, it, that I think he's I don't think that's true. I think that he's known for a couple of Different pieces. He's got a couple of substantial pieces in his oeuvre. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he's reduced to one. But he's I, but I hear what you're saying. He's reduced to one genre. One genre, for sure. But I think he should be because he's the guy in that genre. He's a giant among men sure. in that genre. Now, let's walk out of the MoMA because it's getting stuffy in here. And there's a lot of <laughs> fucking Europeans in our space. And we got to get an iced coffee yeah, and, and go outside. Exactly. Yeah. We're getting an iced coffee with almond milk. And we walk all the way to the <laughs> 70s. And we see this Alice in Wonderland sculpture that I know really well because I grew up as a kid in New York City. And I played on it as a little kid. And it always, you know, the mind of Lewis Carroll always just tripped me out, much like he was probably tripped out on Amanita muscaria uh, mushrooms. But I look at that sculpture, and I could tell you, honestly, I do not know who sculpted that to this day. You do. Jose de Creeft. Okay. So tell me a little bit about Jose de Creeft, about this artist who sculpted this incredible sculpture that basically was part of my childhood. I don't know much about the artist himself, but I do know what makes this work in particular so notable. And the from what I know about this guy, he mostly did sculptures of women. And so I think this was a departure from his style. Although there's Alice. That's true. Well, she's a girl. Don't she's age her up. Yeah, she's yeah, okay. But you're saying women <laughs> as uh, in terms of age. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was commissioned in the 1950s. The sculpture was unveiled in 59. And what I think is so remarkable about this work is that it basically disrupts all standards and expectations of public art. Typically, when we see public art that is conservative or that comes from that era, we see people who are men, mostly, who are monumentalized for their efforts in war or government. And they're not meant to be interacted with. They're just meant as these pillars of power. And with Alice in Wonderland, not only are we celebrating a story, a story about imagination and wonder and childhood, but it is interactive. And it was meant always to be interactive. You mean to be played upon. Exactly, to right. be played with. These right. kids, they're constantly uh, scurrying yeah. underneath the mushroom and leaping on things. And it's a scene of Alice in Wonderland at, and um, the Mad Hatter. Mm -hmm. And there's the Cheshire Cat. So all of our cast of characters, yeah. they're having tea. So Brilliant. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's playful. And I love the fact that it is interactive. Right. And it's kind of cool because thousands of tiny hands, including yours, including mine, have touched it, have touched it. Is and it, now is, it's a patina because of us. Is it a is it a uh, is it a bronze? It, it is, is bronze, right. Yeah, it's bronze, but it is a very shiny bronze because yeah, it looks of this interactivity. Gold, golden. It almost feels golden. OK, so the last work as we're running out of time that we're going to talk about is this piece that you showed me that I thought was a light that fell on the floor. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's what it was or if it was an actual piece of artwork. So can you tell me about this light that accidentally fell on the floor? <laughs> that wasn't a photo. That was my apartment. The light just fell down. <laughs> okay. What, what the hell is that garbage art that we're about to, like, you're about to wax poetically about that's going to suck? Go ahead. So we began with Dia Soho and we'll end with Dia Beacon. The same. This is the same gallery? Well, now we're in Beacon, New York. Okay. So Beacon... This one factory, it used to be a Nabisco factory, and now it's been repurposed as an art gallery for typically minimalistic work. And it is 
one of the most remarkable spaces I've ever been in. It is formidable. It is majestic. And I don't typically like minimalist art. And I stand corrected when I'm in the the halls of Dia Beacon. And the two notable works that are there, I would say Richard Serra's Torqued Eclipse. And that one is a gigantic iron slab. It is not narrative. So it's not objective. It's a shape. And it is so big and imposing that what it does when people are interacting with it, meaning walking alongside it or inside it, that it makes you reimagine the vulnerability of your body and how the body moves through space. That really, even though you don't touch it, you don't climb on it like we do with Alice in Wonderland, we are still heavily interacting. And I'll never forget the first time I was inside this work, I felt dizzy because of the way that the steel kind of curves and swirls inward, that I actually almost fainted. And it really is a powerful monument to being present and being aware of your space. And then the light bulbs that you're talking about is by also a minimalist artist named Dan Flavin. And he's inspired by my darling, Duchamp, where he is exploring the concept of a ready-made. And in this case, it's a prefab industrial light. And so he is literalizing light as subject. And people like Rembrandt, like Caravaggio, they always use light as a subject of their work. But now Flavin is exposing the mechanisms by just putting the actual light against a wall. Okay. This is ridiculous. I'm not done. Uh, Okay. God. (laughs) (laughs) So he also, in addition to this wonderful, brilliant journey, he collapses art genres because the light reflects off the wall and so it's a painting but it's also a sculpture now you can berate me (laughs) no i'm not berating you i just i just strongly disagree that this should even be in the category of anything but a light on the floor i mean you're comparing it you're comparing it like to to caravaggio you know a master of chiaroscuro and and you know a man who used tenebrism so profoundly eloquently is is rembrandt these guys were painters. These guys were masters. These guys were like kings of their craft. I mean, this is, look, I get that this inspires you and I respect you, but I cannot respect this light on the floor. I don't care what it's doing. Right now uh, in, in my studio, we have light bouncing off the wall. And if I captured this in a sculpture or a painting or some kind of motif, would this be a piece of art? I don't think so. I'm just going to... You know, sometimes I'm able to look at things and say, I could see what Lizzie's saying. I could see what you're talking about. With this piece, I strongly disagree. I don't think this is art. I don't think this should be part of the canon of art history. I don't even think we should discuss it. But hey, it's it's open for discussion because the, the shit's on the floor. And maybe we should just do shit on the floor. Maybe well, it's the fact a, that it's, it's on probably the floor. something huge that we could pontificate and wax about like that's so eloquent about shit on the floor. Like you got to look out for number one, but try not to step in number two. <laughs> and the shit on the floor represents the downtrodden and the people who've been marginalized by, you know, this horrible uh, institution called it, life. Yeah. And it debases the elitism of art because there you go. That's right? what I'm saying. So, <laughs> so we just you just could tell me that we can BS our way around anything. And I think when we when we go into something like that, when we put that and we spotlight it, look, a lot of people feel the way you do. And even more so because people are there's collectors who are paying a lot of money for that. So cleverism category, art category. This is in the cleverism category for me. This is once again the conversation, the deeper conversation that we have about the scope of art history and what is really allowed into the canon of of these Jansen gardeners, you know, of the world. That being said, you know, I got to look deeper into light. What's it called? Untitled, probably. Uh, probably. <laughs> there, you don't even know the name of it. Well, they're all untitled. Unbelievable. And then the last thing I'll say about yeah. this work is that, to me, there's also a gender discourse because oh, they are I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> this light All right, we can be, end here. This, this light should be in the uh, in the gay pride parade. It oh. is a flaccid phallus <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> okay, that's illuminating. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for listening. We love you, and we know that you must love this because this 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 just got crazy. All right, peace. <laughs>